Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am really excited about today's episode. Carrie McAvoy. She's a psychologist and a writer who educates on social media about cultivating healthy relationships, deconstructing narcissism, and understanding various other mental health-related issues. Her book, Love You More, gives an uncensored glimpse into the dynamics of narcissistic abuse. And we really uh, get into it, and her story is (laughs) that her memoir, Love You More, The Harrowing Tale of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross. It is, whew, let me tell you, her story is something else. So I'm just going to get right to it and go straight to the interview because I think it's that good. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Carrie McAvoy. Carrie McAvoy, thank you so much for coming on and talking all things narcissistic relationships, getting out, being in. A lot of people say that it takes two to tango. What are your thoughts on that? If you were asking me about a normal relationship between two healthy individuals, I'd say, yeah, because as a, when I worked as a psychologist and, and seeing clients and I saw a lot of healthy couples, there is two people who are contributing to the dynamic of a a dysfunctional relationship. Maybe they're not arguing correctly. Maybe they have miscommunications. Maybe they just get scared and shut down. But what happens in a toxic relationship is a completely different dynamic. And that's what people don't understand is that we we like to think that there's full autonomy, full free will for for both individuals. And this is just a an an expression of the dynamic of the two people coming together. But when there's toxicity, when there's an emotionally immature person, and we might even want to talk about what is that, that Mm -hmm. gets really changed. It becomes about the management of the immature person's psychological needs, drives, desires, fears. And so the other person gets submerged in that relationship. So that's kind of like the setup, but then we can talk more about what is that. Right. And so I love the idea that we get submerged, right? Because this is really about how we lose our sense of capital S self, right? This is, we really do. It's like we're, we, we drown in the power over dynamic of an abusive relationship, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of emotionally immature people, which is people who have narcissistic traits and tendencies, people who start to be on the cluster B in in a di- in the DSM-5 cluster B personality c- disorder category. You know, so we're talking about the antagonistic people. Mm-hmm. Their their sense of ego is really underdeveloped. So it, it need, most of us who've raised kids, we they we know they have inherent weaknesses. Like maybe they're not really great at creativity, or maybe they're not really good at brainstorming ideas. And so they come home with a project from school. And what do they do with their parent? They lean into the parent and say, mom, dad, help me. What ideas should I write about today? What they're doing is they're tapping into your your strengths to help offset their weakness. And that's mm-hmm. kind of a normal part of a development of a self. But when people get fully formed and they still have these big weaknesses inside of themselves, they then find relationships that they can tap into the strength of the other person, which is what happens in narcissistic relationships. Right. They're stabilizing their insecurities, their w- inherent psychological weaknesses through the other person. But they're also casting a person into a role to haul, all, hold all the bad parts, the parts they don't know what to do with. 
like the shame or their guilt or their um, any anything that feels kind of toxic or unwanted in them, then they also put it on this person to hold it for them. So they're leaning into them for stabilization. And they're mm-hmm. also asking this to, pers- to hold on to all their bad parts, which mm-hmm. is, makes right. a really wild dynamic that happens when that when we get into those relationships. Right. And this is why they choose such awesome people. Right. When yeah. people sort of say, well, what's wrong with me that I got, you know, suckered into this, that I fell prey to this? What's wrong with me? And, you know, I say, like, there was nothing wrong with you. You're awesome. That's the that was yeah. the quote problem is <laughs> that they saw <laughs> things in you that they wanted. Um, yeah. Right. And then, you know, I think the abuse occurs when you don't quote, uphold your end of the bargain of sort of giving that part of yourself over to them and making them feel like, right? Because then they still don't have it. And then they're mad at you. Yeah. Yeah. There's somebody called it low receptive capacity. Have you heard of that term before? So what that means is there's people who it came out of McCullen's work way back in, I don't remember, a while ago, I think it was in the 1970s. That he or she found that there is people, It's imagine it's like a colander. And this is what you feel like when you're in these relationships. They feel exhausting. And it's because the more you give, it pours right out of them. You can mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. I love you. You're safe with me. We're good. And then within seconds, they they don't, it, it doesn't stick with them. They're like, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel secure with you. I don't think I'm okay. I, something's wrong here. I'm like, no, I love you. I'm telling you. And you're comforting them and touching them. And it just like is bleeding, right? It's literally bleeding through them. It's yes. like a colander. It's a sieve pouring through them. And that's part of, so part of the problem is, is that whatever you give doesn't stick. There's no, it's no ability to hold and self-soothe within, in, within the structure of these egos of this, these, these people that are struggling we don't know that. We just keep thinking if I say it the right way or do it the right way, we'll fix things and then we'll, we, the relationship will then be able to move on. But no, it just is passing through them as fast as you're giving it to them. So let me ask you this very important question. Is there anything, and this is for my listeners, you guys listen up. Is there anything that we can do uh, in this kind of relationship that will make it stick? That will, you know, seal the holes of the colander. Mm -hmm. Is there anything at all or that they can do, right? To, if let's say they get to a point of narcissistic collapse, if they sort of start to recognize things and they want to change, is it possible? No, no. Um, It's possible for a person to work on themselves and change, but let's go back to the, the toxic individual their sense of self is really um, damaged, really injured. And in the way in that it's injured, it's it's shame resistant, but also incredibly fused with shame. <laughs> so their fear is, if you see me, if you really sit with me and know me, you're not going to choose me or like me. I have to hide that part of myself because I can't stand that part of myself. I hide it from myself. Right. So, it, but to heal, we have to look at those darkest places and then allow someone to take a look and then experience their acceptance of our on, on, of our sense of shame and our unworthiness and experience their 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 like ex, like un, you know, radical acceptance of us their their appreciation their compassion for us that's where the healing it's you know it's the when the child let's go back to because this is to me i i think developmentally i know that yeah. people ask well how does this get formed well it's a combination of things it's it's a combination of developmental factors that happen in the child a combination of maybe environmental factors and also some biological factors so mm-hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. it's now being called a biosocial problem it's a combination of biology and sociality or of social environment but mm-hmm. imagine back when you're with a, a really young child and they really did a big gaffe something huge. Maybe they colored on the walls. I mean, something that they know that there's deep shame around that. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to you and they're kind of gauging how you're going to respond. It's when we respond in a compassionate way that addresses the error, but also addresses our love and appreciation and being able to hold space of them being an imperfect person that they then move forward and know they're good and they're acceptable and everybody makes failures, makes mistakes and failures tolerable. But with these individuals, that does, for whatever reason, 
either, I don't know, I can, I'm not saying it didn't happen. It could have happened and they didn't able to take it. But for whatever reason, they don't believe that's possible. So they never let anyone into that depth. And if you don't, you can't change. It's become sort of this, you know, that finger trap where the more you pull, the yes. more your finger gets stuck. That's what it is. It's more, the, They then keep pulling and they tighten the trap. And if they could just allow the very thing that they fear to happen, they would discover that it's survivable, but they don't. And I guess, you know, what I want to caution, right, because I know my listeners and I know that they like glom on to, oh, but if I just have radical acceptance for them, right, if I just have this radical acceptance that they're seeking, right, but the problem is it's too late because it's the developmental yeah. process. It, they needed that in childhood. There was a wound that was created and along with biology, all, all of these things, right, all this, the perfect storm that like, it's too, it's not your job anymore, yeah. right? That, yeah. that, that ship has kind of sailed. Yeah. Well, even to make it even stick harder is that by the time they reach adulthood, there is now neurological differences in their brain structure. Right. Well, try to change that. I mean, it shows that there's aspects of their neurology that it's ex hyper-focused on one sense of self. They're absorbed with their self. They're, they're constantly gauging the world, view the lens of self, not through you, not through anybody else, not what's happening through self. And they're also, there's a, there's a deficit or a loss of app or empathy. So that means they don't, they can't really, they don't have a sense of how they're impacting you. Maybe they can kind of cognitively, you know, think, think themselves into your position, but they, but they use it right. competitively. They use that information. <laughs> they have what's called instrumental empathy, which means they weaponize the empathy. So anything that they get off of you, then they then think back to that self. How can I take that as an advantage? And then there's some damage done to their sense of conscience. So they don't have the same kind of integrity and morality the rest of the world does, because in their opinion, because back to the shame piece, I can't let you in. They then believe everything is a dog eat dog world. So it's highly competitive and there is no one they're not competing with. They're competing with their children. They're competing with their partner. They're competing with their parents and their siblings. The world's at to them is at war and it's dog eat dog. So you're, you're asking someone to make changes at a neurological level that has become quite fixed. That's why it's called yes. a personality disorder. I don't think people understand that this is not a mental health condition. No. This is a personality disorder. There's a difference. That's why it's in the mm -hmm. DSM-5. It's listed differently. Conditions are things that we know are wrong. When you have depression, you'll say, something's wrong. I don't feel like myself. Same with anxiety. You feel sick with a disorder, so they're classified differently. A disorder is things that's hardwired into the personality. That's that's who I am. So for yes. example, I'm autistic. I have no idea what it's like to see the world as a non-autistic person. Mm -hmm. I, I can fixate on things. I get very literal about things, I, but I wouldn't know what it was like to think the way you think. Mm -hmm. I just know what it's like to think the way that I think. That's my only world perspective. Personality disorders are that. They're, mm. they're permanent hard wiring of a personality mm -hmm. and they don't know any other perspective and they don't have a problem with it. They actually, in some ways, maybe they don't like everything about themselves, but they'll say, I've always been this way. This is who I am. And that's why they say, you are the problem. I didn't, I didn't have a problem until you came into my life and started making it a problem because therefore you're the problem because I'm happy with the way I am. I am me. And now a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Primus Bank. If you've listened to recent episodes, then you've heard me talk about how important it is to establish a new checking account separate from your spouse. And you've also heard me talk about Primus Bank and all the wonderful resources they've put together for people going through a separation or divorce. Well, there's another fee-free account that they have that gives you more earning potential than most banks' high-yield savings accounts. That's right, Primus Bank. Premium checking comes with one of the nation's highest rates, currently a 5.07 annual percentage yield. And all it takes is a dollar to open. So let me say that again, 5.07%. Just like Primus Perks, every Primus Premium account comes with free ATM use nationwide, no overdraft fees. It has early paycheck deposit, plus there is no account maximum, and they'll never cap your interest earnings. Whether you've heard of Primus before or the name is new to you, you should take a look. 
They are not like your typical online bank. They're a member FDIC and they have real 24 seven customer service. Plus the extra work they're doing for their customers, like what they've put together for people who are going through a divorce is anything but typical. Head on over to premisebank.com slash DSG to view more details on Premise Premium Checking and also their other divorce resources like guides, blogs, and so much more. So that is Premise, P-R-I-M-I-S dot com slash DSG to take advantage for more resources and to start opening an account today. It really only takes a few minutes. And now back to our show. I've never had this problem in any other relationship, which is, by the way, like, really? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure you did, <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right? And maybe right. maybe they weren't pushing back the way that I am. Maybe they aren't, you right. know, maybe they just got, got out of Dodge. Maybe they left and they didn't. I want to talk about this sort of the slow dismantling of self. This is the kind of thing that by the time you realize it, it it's so far gone. You are functioning in this relationship the way that normal people function in a relationship. Oh, you have a wound around this. I'm going to do my part to help you and let you know that the world is a safe place or this relationship is a safe place and that it's not the same as your childhood or whatever. And in a normal, healthy, functioning relationship, there is that reciprocity. But in a narcissistic or abusive relationship, there's not. It is that sort of colander, right? You're pouring yourself into it. It's going out the bottom. It's not sticking with them. And also, there is no reciprocity. So you're actually not getting refilled by the relationship. You're simply getting siphoned out of in the relationship. What I'm, I sort of want to sort of, I don't know if we can mm, diagram or whatever the, this, this slow loss of self, right? If you have known yourself to be something amazing. And now suddenly you feel like a shell of yourself. That's not your fault. (laughs) Right. Exactly. It it comes back to that, that frame that I just said a few seconds ago. So let me establish the frame. Healthy people grow up in a world in which they experience mutuality. They're allowed to fail. They, there's a give and take sacrifices done on both parts. We, we view the world cooperatively. It's almost like we play on the same baseball team and we all just have different roles, but we're working together for the same goal. And we, mm-hmm. we see that kind of reciprocity and shared, shared interest and shared investment. We assume when we get into these relationships that everyone has this same perspective. And you, you mentioned that there's, that there's a certain type of people who are more vulnerable to this relationship. And you're absolutely right. Sandra Brown did this large study in 2014 of 600 couples. And she found that there were two thirds of the group had two strong personality traits that made them particularly vulnerable to this relationship. And then one third had a different type of a history. So the two thirds had no history of trauma, no childhood problems, but they had two characteristics in their personalities that were very strong unusually strong. They were agreeable, meaning they were cooperative team players, just somebody you'd want to work with, perfect for to hire. The other the other strength they had was they scored high on conscientiousness. They were people who had a strong sense of integrity. They understood what the boundaries were. They had stick to itiveness. They were determined and they really believed in the goodness of people that if you mm. just worked hard enough at something, things would improve. These, yes. those characteristics, oh, <laughs> me, I'm number two, too. Yeah. You, you, you get eight people with either one of these strong characteristics. They're more vulnerable to being getting into these relationships. And it makes sense because if you're a toxic person who sees everybody as dangerous, you would want somebody who's going to stick with it, who believes you're good no matter what, who's going to work. You see what I'm saying? It's the perfect like fit. The other one third of the group, though, did have a history of trauma and childhood abuse and that this was a legacy problem. It was familiar. So yes. they've been in it before and then they get it in, into it again. And I actually fit both groups. I have Me a too. legacy <laughs> problem and I'm also yeah, and I also have a lot of uh, conscientiousness. OK, yep. so Same but girl. we're cooperative We're we see the world cooperatively. It's like like I said, that that softball team or baseball team, we're all on the same team. Now, mm-hmm. the people yes. who have antagonistic personalities see the world as at war. It's the tug of war, but the down and dirty type that if you lose, you die. 
Okay. And you're pitted against every single person. Not It's not a team activity. It's a one-on-one activity. So you can't allow vulnerability. You can't allow them control. You can't allow them to see you because any of that will get used against you. They're going to equip themselves with those tools and use it against you because that's what you're doing to everyone around you. You're doing the same thing. So you put these yes. two people together and you're in trouble because the first person you, you met that was so wonderful in the beginning, you didn't know that you actually were experiencing covert aggression. Have you ever heard of that term before? I have not. So explain what that, of, yes, what does that mean and how yeah. does it work? Yeah, yeah. so Especially in the beginning. Aggression. Mm-hmm. So that love bombing is actually covert aggression. Ah, uh, okay, 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 got it. Okay, got it. so yes. it comes out of G- George Simon's work in Sheep's Clothing and Character Disturbances. He says, and this, if you think about it, There's many different types of aggression, but unfortunately, we don't educate people on how to spot covert aggression. Covert aggression is the cat sneaking up on the mouse. Mm -hmm. It's subtle, right? Yeah, harming, seductive. It's 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 smooth. It's the smooth operator. When you meet the person in the beginning, they're all about convincing you. They they desire you in an aggressive way. They want to they want to win you over. They want to capture you. They want to yes. dominate you. Yes. You've become their target. And so they move in on you, wooing you to convince you to be in this relationship with them. You think you've met the perfect match to you because you don't realize all the tactics they're using is actually aggressive tactics. So they're matching you. They're imitating you. They're they're um, they're presenting themselves a self that you want to see. You don't realize all of that is part of the hunt that they're yes. actually... it's. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, right, they are also genuinely seeing things in you that they admire and that they want for themselves. So they are complimenting you. You're the one. I've never met anyone like you. All of those right. things. And I think in it, they do mean that, right? But they don't mean it it's in... Part- yeah. Well, they don't mean it in the way that you and I would, right? Which is like, that's amazing. No, they, You're an well, awesome individual. Yeah. It's, I want it. It's it's a it's a threat in you that I need to take away. Yeah, there is there's, there's a piece of them that idealize you. They've put you up on the pedestal. You're, they see it's it's like I think the best analogy is you're everyone is an object to them. There aren't people, right. they're objects. Yeah. Right. So they yeah. see you and you're like the the best newest iPhone that's ever come out in the world and they want that. So they're going to like do whatever they can to convince that they'd be the perfect owner for that. Right, so they, yes, right. they, they, you know, they show up as your perfect match to convince you you're the one, but you think that they see you as a person because there's so much of a matching. You don't realize that you've just met the twin of yourself, that they're mirroring you. So that's why it's so incredibly seductive because you're not really meeting them. They're, you're meeting that who they believe that you want to meet in order for them to get a relationship with you. Which, yeah, so that's the covert aggression. It's it's the it's the desire, it's desire of hunting, but it's hunting out of desire, not hunting right. out of rage or anger or revenge or all the other reasons that we're more familiar with. So they get you into the relationship, but they still that you're still there's still competition that's happening. They still find you dangerous. And now is now instead of the pedestal, now they're in the relationship, you're the threat because you potentially could outshine them. Mm. All the wonderful things they once admired about you that they hope would fix them getting Mm. into the relationship with you. Now they see as it's going to eclipse them or you're going to know them. And then if you know them, you're going to reject them. So there's this I think there's almost this twin fear of I don't want you being better than me, but I can't let you get close because you would reject me and I can't be abandoned. So they have these these fears that are happening. And I also think at the same time that your goodness, they resent. And I also think they disrespect your your conscientiousness. Your they dis, they they have contempt for what they these beautiful qualities in you that make you uniquely wonderfully you. They they see that as weakness, as vulnerability, as, as silly. Why why would you be? Who would ever show that to the world? That's that's showing your underbelly. I wouldn't. They mm. wouldn't do that. So what they once saw as lovely, they've twisted it into something ugly. So there's this weird dynamic, but you, what yeah. you on your side experience, you don't know any of this. You just suddenly find that this amazing person that you thought was everything now has these complaints or is ouchy or it's conflictual. And you start to like modify thinking, well, we can get back to where we were. I must have done something to sort of trigger this or maybe some dynamic between us. And if we can fix it, we can get back there. You don't realize 
that they're actually now picking away at you because what once they love, they now loathe. And what you don't realize is that the thing that you keep trying to get back to was never real. Yes. It wasn't, it was the trap. Yes. It was all the sale. I always called the sale. They're ma- yeah. They made a sale, but you didn't buy, you, you thought you were buying, a, you know, a Rolls Royce and you got an old fashioned Pinto, you know, that's going <laughs> to explode on you. You didn't know that. <laughs> so like, it's a reveal, like, oh, sorry, it's not what you thought. It's really this. <laughs> right. And you're like, well, wait, where's the, hold on a minute. If we just maybe mm-hmm. buff this a little bit better, it'll show, it'll be the Rolls Royce, right? If I just right, like, exactly. I don't know. And they want you to think that too, because remember, they they don't think they have the problem. They have a disorder. The disorder is that's who they are. So they say, well, everything was good until we got into the relationship. So I was fine before. You must be the problem. And so this is and this is how we lose this like whittling away of ourself, right? Because then then we start to, if we're the problem, then we're like, okay, well then I'll shift in this way. I'll give up. Yeah. This part of me is a problem. I'll give that up, right? I, there's a there's a that's a great story. That's not a great story. It's a terrible story. But when I met my ex husband, I was a very sexually expressive, free exploratory. I was just sort of coming into my own sexuality, right? And mm-hmm. that was something that he really sort of was into until he was threatened by it. And he told me he very yeah. you know because he's because he has that sort of covert vulnerability where he says, you know, it's just, I just, you, you're, you're so much more experienced than I am. I, it's intimidating. I, right. And so I learned to tamper down my sexuality, right. Until 10 years later, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you. You're not a sexual person. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. And then I believed I was no longer a sexual person. And I decided like, I had, I had sexual issues and it was my fault. Right. And then when I got out of the relationship and started dating again, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I think it was not the problem here. <laughs> you know, this yeah. was not my issue. Right. But I had tamped it down, tamped it down, tamped it that I lost that part of myself for a good 10 years. Yeah. You start to like, you start to treat it like there's a code. Like when you're the person who's yes. experiencing it. And I also experienced it. I, I was married for 31 years to a pretty good guy. We had a problem. I mean, it was an, a long marriage and he passed away from cancer. And then I really approached dating like a, a new job. I really wanted to get back to the life that I had because I had spent my entire adulthood in a relationship. So I wanted yeah, to get back sure. into a relationship. Yeah. So two years out, I, I, I meet this really, I think this perfect person. Uh, everything that I had, I even had made a checklist and he like checked everything off on the list. And I just thought it was incredible. So, and then a year later we get into the relationship and there was little subtle signs that I didn't recognize were gaslighting or was a minimization and, or, you know, he was already like settings that setting the tone for the relationship. I didn't really appreciate that. Again, I thought this is a cooperative relationship. This is what people do. You give, he gives, and and we meet in the middle is what I thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I get into mm -hmm. the relationship and a, (laughs) a month into it, I had this devastating discovery. I found out that not only had he lied about one of my non-negotiables, because um, I discovered him doing it on our honeymoon night, instead of having an intimacy with me, he's doing this other thing. Mm-hmm. And, then, and, and then on the last night of the honeymoon, I wake up to a letter from another woman saying, by the way, I've been <sighs> dating your husband for the past three months. Uh, and then that my whole world imploded. And I write about in the book, Love You More. My whole world implodes as I discover that who I thought I was in a relationship with, I don't know anything about. Right. He's had a secret double life. Yes. And so, and he had already been like starting to implement sort of the system of breaking me down on that honeymoon. He, it, it was like a light switch happened. Like before there was life that I knew. And then on that honeymoon, he really instituted a new way of being with me, which is you must do the things that I want. And if you don't, then there's going to be withholding. I'll get, I'll get sullen. I'll stonewall. I'll disappear. Um, Then Mm -hmm. I'm going to confuse you by showing up and being fantastic again and saying, I want everything that you want. And then the mixed minute that you quite don't please me, I will pull back again. So this intermittent reinforcement was already being really heavily introduced on that honeymoon. But yeah, it was devastating, but you're right. They, they find a way to dim you. And yeah. and you being, like I said, back to this cooperative worldview, you just think, well, if I work hard at it, we'll just stumble into the right code and we'll fix things. The problem is they don't, there's no cooperation in their world. It's domination. 
And so right. everything they're doing is to keep in control of you so that they can manage themselves, manage their insecurities, and also manage your uh, the intimacy. They don't want you too close because if you get too close, then they'll you'll know them and see them. And that's back to that shame piece and rejection piece. They don't want to risk that. So they don't want you too close. And they also, they don't want you, they don't want you showing them up and they don't want you to abandon them unless they're ready to have you leave. So they put everything under their control. And so you keep working, thinking it's going to make things better without realizing, no, what you're doing is submerging yourself into their agenda, their, their, their purpose, the way that they want this relationship. And this whole thing about them not wanting you to get close, what I think is really interesting is the way that they will masquerade intimacy. You actually think you're close. You think you're closer than like any, than you've ever been to anyone in a sense. Right. And then when it's not quote real, right. It's your fault, right. It's then it's your fault. Yeah. You have intimacy problems. They're yeah. not there. They're, yeah. It's not the fact that they actually are incapable of intimacy, right. It's your intimacy problem. Right. Right. If you think about it, the, 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 the skill of empathy is is when we get in touch with our sense of who we are and what life feels like for us, and then we understand that that's how other people experience the world. It mm -hmm. really is the connector between us and other people. So right. if I know what it feels like to lose something, and then you tell me that your dog passed away, I can I can even though maybe I never had a dog. I have a sense of wow. Well, it was hard for me when I lost a close friendship that moved away. I can't imagine what it'd be to, to lose a pet that has been almost like a child to me. So mm -hmm. that allows me to connect with your pain. They don't really have a strong sense of that. And on top of mm -hmm. it, whenever they do use emotions, they use it to, for, to gain some advantage, some upper hand. So it, there isn't that intimacy. What you're experiencing is this shallow imitation of emotions. Yeah. It seems to be a, intimate. It seems like there's a connection, but it's really all about masking and hiding themselves. They're not real authentic with themselves very well. So they're not authentic with you either, but mm -hmm. we don't know that. I mean, I, the guy I thought, I thought he was tender. Um, he cried at things I thought was really touching. I didn't realize that probably all of this was either manipulative or mm -hmm. just a, a shallow understanding of what I what I thought it to be. I, I thought it was something deeper. And yet when you really looked at it, I mean, one of the things he teared up about his son and their connection. And yet when you looked at the history of this child, he worked long hours. He's a workaholic and he was he was also having lots of relationships on the side. So he was hardly home. So and then he left home and the kid was 10. And then he pretty much was outside of that relationship from then on because he basically abandoned the kid, although complained that it was ex kept him from the child. But no, he didn't make opportunities to see this kid. But he acted as if like, you know, this was a great loss. But when you look at the story, what actually happened, like, no, it, that doesn't actually line up. There's something really right. wrong with this picture. But we don't we don't pay. It. That's the other problem, I think, with those of us who get caught in these relationships. We we're invested enough and in wanting to believe in the goodness of a person. We don't stand back and say two and three it, that you're saying it's four it's no it's five it's not adding up we don't we ever yeah. stop it. i mean if i ever did that like i mean there's a part of me that's like yeah but when i look at your history and i know what that relationship with that kid looks like now eh, i'm not buying it i mean there was a part of me that could feel the the discrepancy and that's called by the way cognitive dissonance we could feel the discrepancy but we don't ever like because of the kindness in us like the really the goodness in us we like we don't make a point of it like, and both well, we don't, know, it would be conflictual if we do it, you know, we'll blow the whole thing up and there'll be an argument. So why do it? Well, and also we don't, well, we don't want to believe that about them, right? Yeah. Because we love them or we think we love whatever it is, right? We don't want to believe that about them, but also because of the way that we view the world in this collaborative, empathic, you know, we're all on the same team and we're all basic, we believe in the basic goodness. It, it, it is that cognitive dissonance, right? Like, well, someone behaving that way doesn't line up with um, what I believe of the world. Like someone wouldn't do that, <laughs> right? right? Like right. why would someone lie about that? And until you've right. experienced somebody who is this disordered, you don't actually understand that worldview. Like it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't compute for us. No, I mean, yeah, that's another problem is the world in, in general, as much as this is, a, is 
I, I once asked, I got to interview Sandra Brown and I said, so how and she worked with very pathological people, like mm-hmm, psychopaths mm-hmm. and sociopaths. And I once asked her, so what percent of the world do you think is predatory? That was my question. What percentage of the world's predatory? And she said, oh, 20%. One out of five. It's a lot of people. It's predatory. It's a lot of people. I And then years ago, years and years ago, I, I had this mentor, supervisee, and he played a huge role in the state. He was on the disciplinary committee for the state of, of a licensed psychologist at the time. So he really had a sense of what was happening in the, not only in the scope of the state, but the scope of the, of the country around psychology. And I asked him, so what percentage of the world is healthy? Oh dear. And he, he said 7%. I don't know where he got the number seven, but it was less than 10%. Yeah. Okay. So put that together. Right. So only one out of 10 people has it reasonably together and healthy and knows how to navigate relationships in a, you know, reasonable fashion. But one out of five people is going to view the world predatory and view you as another predator and, and will approach things in that light. So, so yeah, we, we don't realize that. So the, the world as a whole, though, if you were to say that the world as a whole, they're like, no, that's too negative. Why would we do that? Can't be true. People are better than that. But the problem I have with that belief is as much as I want it to be not true, yeah. it puts me in a disadvantage to believe that it's not true. Because if I walk around, I used to basically think the world's a good place, even though I yeah. didn't have a lot of good experiences growing up. I somehow just wanted to believe that the world was better than my own home life. But the the problem is, is I'm not on guard and I'm not watching for that five, that, that, that one out of five per- people. I'm not watching yeah. for the 20%. So, so I think that's the other problem victims hit is that when we go to people and we say this happens, like, no, you must have misunderstood it. That, they didn't mean that. They didn't. They weren't purposely being passive aggressive or even sadistic or cruel. They, you must, you know, that he, that person's a good person. Maybe that was just a misunderstanding, which mm-hmm, then mm-hmm. gaslights us on another level. Then we think, well, maybe I am making a big deal out of nothing. Right. Uh, so yeah, the, the cognitive dissonance is happening on all levels within us. That also the confusion with them. We met a great person in love bombing. We thought that's who we met. So right. who we're living with competes with that. It doesn't line up. So we have that discrepancy. And then we have the discrepancy the world around us like, no, they're a good guy. They're a wonderful woman. You must have misread things. It can't be that bad. Later on, when you're in the relationship and things are happening in the sort of inside the relationship, but they are, but they behave to the, to the outside world, like all these other, you know, this wonderful, wonderful guy. And nobody can believe Dr. Romney will say like a communal narcissist who like out in the community doing wonderful things. They're, you know, coaching all the teams, they're volunteering here and there, but on the inside of the relationship, they are, they're destroying us. And then when we say anything to the outside world, they're like, what are you talking about? He's like the greatest guy ever. Right. 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 And then, um, one of the things that I think is, I, I talk about in my book and I know you talk about too, is because sometimes it's really hard for us to pinpoint the behaviors that they're doing, right? We focus so much on them and what they're doing as opposed to like how this relationship makes you feel. You have a, you have, I know you have an Instagram reel about this, like eight things that, you know, that you're doing. And not doing in terms of like, you're wrong, right? That show that you're actually being gaslit or abused, right? And so can you talk about a few of those things that are, yeah. instead of focusing on them and what they're doing, because it's so confusing and the target is always moving and that's the point, how you feel in this relationship. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And it comes back to, I always like to start like from why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. So when we are, we want the world to be safe. Mm-hmm. That that's all of our primary goals. In fact, uh, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs said, you know, first is you want to survive. You want shelter and you want fight, you know, warmth and you need food and water. Right. But once you get yeah. that survival, then you want to know that you're safe. You don't you want to know there's no predators around. There's no snakes. You can, you know, fall asleep safely, all of these types of things. So we're essentially driven to keep ourselves safe. There's two ways to do it. There's keeping ourselves safe. So how we feel in the moment 
whether or not like right now, does this interview feel good? Do I feel like there's respect? Do I like what's happening? I mean, that's one way is I could just internally assess and then decide what I'm going to do. But most of us don't do that. That's a, it's a harder thing to do. Sure. Most of us say, does this, does the world around me feel safe? Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. do I like where I'm at? Do I have shelter? You know, is she asking me, the, you know, thinking back to this interview, are you asking me the right questions? So I would, and then we, we put it out externally. So that's what we do in relationships. We put our safety, safety out in external ways. Oh, he's not coming home on time. Or um, when they get angry, they storm out. You know, she storms out and doesn't talk to me. So maybe we, she needs to learn better communication skills. Maybe we get into counseling. Maybe if we read the next book together, things will get better and we'll do well. And then that person will change and then I'll feel safer. That's mm-hmm. really what we're doing. We're putting all the effort out there. But, right. th- but we actually lose control when we put our safety out externally. Our greatest control is what happens, what what we notice about ourselves internally, and then we make a decision within ourselves. So, yes. Yeah, so, for example, gaslighting has an effect on you. And that's what you're referring to is that that uh, the eight things that happens when you are consistently gaslit, you, it starts to shape you. So you then change in a way, hoping that this somehow will create safety outside of you and change the situation. I used to do it one of the, the top ways, and I got that actually, this comes out of Dr. Romney's certification training. Mm-hmm. And when I heard this, I thought, oh my goodness, I checked off. I did all of, I practically did all of these things in a relationship. So something bad would happen. I'd make a discovery that he was somehow unfaithful or risking moving in the mm-hmm. direction of becoming unfaithful again, because my ex was a serial cheater. Um, mm-hmm. I would then, we'd have this big conversation and he would gaslight me around it. Oh, I'm making it up. Or I'm too sensitive or he's working the program or I can't see, can I see how much he's trying to really, you know, be in this relationship and be invested. And I would walk away from the, the conversation feeling completely confused and turned around and not knowing what's up and down. So I'd write him a long letter and I would outline all the points that he missed and why I was feeling in the way that I'm feeling, thinking if I could somehow explain it in a logical way, because whatever I said, he twisted up so fast that if I could put it on on paper and he read it, maybe he understood and maybe we'd be able to do better and, and things would smooth out, which out realizing that my, my effort of writing the long letter really indicated I wasn't feeling heard. It was really mm-hmm. indicating that in these relationships, the conversations always got very weird, convoluted, and left me completely baffled or upset. Yes. And that that was the problem. It wasn't that he needed to have clear communication with me. I'd always been clear. Mm-hmm. I had not had any problem else in my life. Good grief. I've been a psychologist for over 20 years and sat with you know hundreds of thousands of co- clients who right. clearly understood what I was saying. So <laughs> I teach this I mean, shit. I'm I mean, like, <laughs> Exactly. So it's not my communication problem. The problem is the fact that he doesn't want to hear what I have to say. He wants to leave me confused. So I didn't, I put all that effort out. So that's one of the things that I I agree with you. I think if we got better at understanding what it feels like to be celebrated, to Mm. really feel safe with somebody, to know that you're, you're more, that it's a relationship expands you instead of contracts you that then yeah. we move in the direction of those relationships and we avoid the relationships that, that dim, contract, make us small, make us feel edgy and unsafe. If we could get really good at identifying that right away, which I'll tell you, honestly, I suck at it because I am now you know, so good at submitting, so good at pleasing that the minute I get into a relationship with yeah. somebody, I'm already like, what do you need? What do you want? How can I do this better? Yep. Instead of like, instead of, yep. which is already, I'm, I'm centering them. I'm not centering me. But if right. I could get to the place of like, do they make me feel like I can say whatever I want in the way that I want to say it and not make me feel weird or awkward or ashamed of that? Um, yeah. Do they do they actually encourage conversation from me? Do they allow me to be quirky? You know, when I'm a little autistic or maybe a little driven in a certain way, do they create space for that? That's what we should be paying attention to, but we don't. That's right. That's right. I think what's interesting is I don't know about I don't know about you, but as I've as I've gotten older and as I've done more healing work and all of the things, right? It doesn't mean that I don't get into these relation I don't see relationships but like start dating someone or get attracted to this or whatever like start to get sucked in I mean if we're talking one in five like the the chances are really fucking good <laughs> that we're gonna yeah. get yeah right but I know that for myself I I still will find myself getting sucked in a little bit but my lead time in putting a stop to it has has shrunk significantly yes 
And it's still, look, it's still devastating and heartbreaking and like demoralizing. And, you know, I think the worst thing for me is this feeling that my worldview may like actually not be um, correct, right? This worldview of like, everybody's good. And, you know, there's just bad things happen to good people. And like this, there's that stripping away of our own sort of feeling that the world is good. It's really hard, but at least like it is. it'll be, it'll be like two weeks or like four weeks as opposed to 10 years now. Yes. Yes. Right. I agree. It, it's the same for me. It is the same for me. I recently ventured out to dating again and Ugh. this last year, right now I'm not again, but I tried me again too. and, and I <laughs> met, met two different guys. I met two different guys and, and I quickly, and I was the one like, uh, something's off here. I don't, I feel, you know, I'm noticing that I'm feeling squelched and I'm noticing that I'm giving up a lot or I'm noticing the relationship feels really flat or it's, I feel very lonely. That's another big tip off to me. I start to feel lonely. That means there's not, there's not any intimacy. There's this shallowness to the relationship. I need a mm -hmm. deep relationship. So I'm getting faster too. Like you said, it's a matter of weeks, not a matter of years. Right, <laughs> or, right. you know, I'd, and the other thing I've noticed is I've slowed down. Um, I don't, I don't want to rush. I'm I'm not interested in that a rushing kind of fast paced startup. I want plenty of space for me. And I think that's another really big, big difference that I've, I've implemented for myself. That's really helped out too. And I think that, you know, that even leads me to how to, when you're in a relationship that has dimmed you and now you're out and you're trying to heal, I think it's really important. People ask, well, I feel stuck. How come I'm not doing better? I think we have to do a lot of focus on ourselves. We really have to nurture ourselves back alive. I mean, yes. imagine if you're, if you're a plant, and you lived in an environment that basically didn't water feed you or give you good light. Just they just gave you enough to survive. And you've you've withered, you shriveled, your color is bad. You need to really pour into yourself to get yourself to flourish again. And and we have to figure out and we haven't been allowed to do that. So that's a shift in thinking. So so I encourage people to really like, what do you like to do? What kind of foods do you like to eat? Are you doing yes. the activities you really enjoy? Who do you hang around that makes you feel more? Start to do those things. Re really pursue the things that make you come alive. And it's when you start to feel more of that and then you meet this again, you're a little less interested. You're aware of something's off because mm -hmm. you've been right. putting back into yourself what really should have been there. So you're able to recognize it faster when it's not there. That's right. That's right. And I think the, you know, Dr. Romney says, and I fully, fully agree with this, like, take a year. Don't, mm. like, give yourself space and time. The number of women I see that are just diving into new relationships, mm -hmm. and they're, they're amazing, and they're the one, and all the things, and it's like, how could you know that when you're so yeah. withered, and you're so, yeah. like, you have no, you don't have your sense of self? How could you possibly know um, anything yeah. about this new person and new relationship. So take that full year to just yeah. find out who, what you like to eat, what your favorite colors. I mean, the basics that we lose, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. We've lost the basics. The very, we, I, I was able to interview Dr. Kristen Milstead. She wrote the book, Why Can't I Just Leave? Highly recommend mm -hmm. that book, by mm -hmm. the way. It's a fabulous book. And she said, because she was also, she's a sociologist or a researcher, and she'd been in one of these relationships. She sort of shares her story in the context of all this great research and help. But she said in the interview, it's like your voice is barely a whisper. That's Yourself, right. your your voice is barely a whisper, but it's still there. It Don't give up. It's still there. You just need to start to heal it so that you can find yourself. For me, the interestingly enough, I got out of that relationship in 2019. My son was super ill um, mm. in the story I share that he, my son was diagnosed with cancer. That was mm. my, that brought me home. It got me out of the relationship. It, it was the door that I needed to, to exit because it yeah. allowed me to exit safely with a very dangerous person. And then I spent the first six months focusing on him. And about the time he, his chemotherapy was over and he was in remission, COVID hit. Oh, dear. Well, right. I work for myself and yeah. I live alone in a small studio. And uh -huh. so I, my world became me. So for right. a year, I was shut down with just me. And I, that, I'll have to tell you, honestly, that was a gift. It wasn't an easy thing to do, but 
uh, it brought me so much healing to just yep. know how to figure out how to make the uh, every day good with just me that yeah. I could maybe see people virtually, but I wasn't going to see people in real life. So I, I agree with you. I really think that we do ourselves a favor. And I know, I understand. I, I was scared. I mean, I, I have a lot of issues about um, abandonment and, and yes. not wanting to be alone. That's very Same. terrifying for me too. I get that. But mm -hmm. I, I find that when you, when you can move in it, and here's what I discovered is that I have a relationship with me. I've never had a relationship with me before. And that's not something anybody can take away from you. So That's discovering right. the, the beauty of me and knowing that already that, that I can show up for me really now has equipped me to be in a better position. So I'm less vulnerable going forward. I love it. Carrie, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so enlightening and interesting. And I know that my audience is going to eat it up. So <laughs> where can everyone find you? You can find me TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Carrie McAvoy PhD. And the same with my website, CarrieMcAvoyPhD.com. Great. And that's M little C, big A, V O Y. Yes, Carrie, thank you exactly. so, so, so much. This has been really great. Oh, it's been wonderful too. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.